everything revolves around nature. And biodiversity, in many ways, is life. So when we experience nature loss, it means the loss of everything that we depend on to live, of our food, of air that we breathe, of all other ecosystem services that come from nature. And the way we are, we are destroying nature, in turn, destroys all our ways of life. It is so perfectly true that the quality of life and the level of civilization depends on the availability of energy. The amount of energy that is available to the countries with the highest quality of life is 10 times greater than the amount of energy that is available to the people who live in the poorest countries. This cannot endure. If we're already in a situation where we have high levels of poverty, when something like climate change comes, it finds us in a very vulnerable situation. So the vulnerability is already there and it's being exacerbated by climate change. What is development? Well, development is an economic model. It's an economic sector. It's the built environment. It's business as usual, how we've built cities and civilizations and countries forever. And so we need to address all the different facets of a complex system to reach that sustainable future. Food systems and agriculture are the biggest contributor of greenhouse gas emissions. And in fact, science shows us that all the action that we take, they will not make a difference unless we tackle food systems. That's how important food systems are. Chickens are the most efficient animals at turning the crops that we feed to them into animal meat. It takes nine calories fed to a chicken to get one calorie back out in the form of chicken meat. For our pigs, it's something like 11 or 12 calories in. For aquaculture fish, it's about 10. Uh, for cattle, it's 40 calories in to get one calorie back out. That is just extraordinarily inefficient. Right now, we use 3 billion hectares of land for animal agriculture out of the 4 billion hectares of land that we use for all agriculture. Twice as much meat in 2050 means 6 billion hectares of land. That is a biodiversity nightmare. It's also a climate change nightmare. The world consumes about 350 million metric tons of land animal meat. We're going to see those numbers continue to go up. That is the opposite of sustainability. About 70% of medically relevant antibiotics are fed to farm animals for their entire lives. That is driving antibiotic resistant bacteria so that if you get sick or you have a cut um, or you need an operation, the antibiotics that stave off infection won't work. So meat is currently linked to deforestation, to biodiversity loss, to multiple global health scourges, and is 20% of direct climate emissions. We're gonna produce 80 to 100% more meat in 2050. All of these problems get worse. When you talk about food systems and how to solve that puzzle, you need to look at how food is produced. And then of course you have to look at diets. What do we eat? What do we consume? And how does that contribute? How much of that do we waste? Actions we take on those three issues, on how we produce our food, on how what we consume, and also tackling food waste will reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The question we have to ask as we move towards the future of food is, why do we eat the way we eat? You know, how much of it is autonomous? How much of it is self-decided? And how much of it is told to us that this is how you want to eat? Biodiversity on your plate equals to biodiversity in the planet. I think as an individual, one of the biggest things we can do is how we eat to impact the climate crisis. A lot of these future foods actually come from the tropics. We are looking at ingredients like moringa, baobab, Brazilian grape, seaweed, which is a very popular ingredient for the future, breadfruit, and like ackee, for example, from Jamaica, which is like a, a vegan egg almost, but a fruit. What we want to create in the way we eat in the future is an equitable, diverse food system that nourishes us, nourishes our community, but also nourishes the world. When we're thinking about the food system and replacing it with something that is more sustainable, there is no viable, scalable solution today. But we obviously see signs of that. We see the weak signals in the things that are emerging and being innovated on that will 
bring that to us into the future. Cell-based meat, synthetic biology, vertical farming, some of these practices that are allowing us to be smarter about how we produce food, but also a little bit more creative. Because we are, as human beings, we are very set to the processes of how we've always done things, how we've always sourced things, and how we always eat things ourselves. We're here at the Dubai Future Forum. We're gonna taste the future of food, so we're gonna see where the future's going, what has come around, cellular agriculture, precision fermentation, fungus, and, and all those new things are the, the future of food. This is the future, the global health imperative, the biodiversity imperative, the climate imperative. And we saw that today in the UAE at the Museum of the Future. So we tasted the future um, and it tasted great. The idea of cultivated meat is just like you can take a seed or a cutting from a plant, bathe the seed or the cutting in nutrients and that will grow into a full plant. You can take a small sampling of cells from a chicken or a pig or a cow or a fish, bathe those cells in nutrients and they will grow into actual animal meat. This is a very nascent technology, so there are scientific challenges with the cell culture media, there are scientific challenges with growing the cells in large enough uh, bioreactors to reach price competitiveness. But if we can give consumers the exact same meat that they love culturally, except that it is cleaner, doesn't have bacterial contamination, doesn't have antibiotic residues, if it's seafood, it doesn't have mercury or dioxin contamination, or in the case of plant-based meat, it tastes exactly the same, it looks exactly the same, except that the plant-based version is less expensive, has less fat, no cholesterol, some fiber, it's a healthier product. We don't think it's gonna be that hard uh, to convince people to change. This is very much like renewable energy. Renewable energy cannot take off um, until you retool the grid to make sure that um, it can actually be delivered to everybody um, and bring down prices so that it's cost competitive with fossil fuels. Um, until that happens, renewable energy does not win in the marketplace. Energy systems around the world are increasingly diverse in the broadest sense of people, geographies, users, technologies, and systems. So the first D is diversity. The next D, of course, is decarbonisation. The natural pace of decarbonisation of energy has been going on for centuries, but the challenge facing humanity now is to achieve a net zero energy system by 2050. The third D is digitalization. Digitalization is increasingly evident in all parts of the energy system. It's enabling us to think about how do we develop smarter and more automatic systems which supply and manage the balance between demand and supply in different parts of the world. The fourth D is decentralization. As we shift from energy system based on fossil fuels and nuclear to more decentralized but abundant renewable energy systems, we also expect that energy systems will become more localized. So there'll be a mix of centralized and off-grid and hybrid grids and different types and shapes of energy system. And the fifth D is disruption. The energy world is being rocked by a series of crises, everything from energy insecurity to cost of living crisis to what will be the impacts of climate change. And we see that in terms of extreme weather, storms, floods, forest fires, ice storms, all impacting energy systems everywhere. Managing a global energy transition, or let's say multiple energy transitions, is an unprecedented historic challenge. So energy literacy is really, on all of us, a requirement to think about our responsibility in understanding our roles and our choices in contributing to the energy transition journey. Terrestrial solar energy, of course, is extremely important and can be highly effective when the sun is shining. 
the problem is that sunlight doesn't always shine. And if you want to have sustainable energy, you need another option. In space, near Earth, the sun is about 30% more intense than it is here on Earth. If you are in a high Earth orbit, the sun never sets. There is no nighttime. And so 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, you can harvest the sunlight. In space, there is no weather. There are no clouds, there is no rain, there is no snow, there is no dust. In space, you can harvest the power anytime you want it. This combination of greater intensity, almost continuous availability, and dispatchability, the ability to send the power where you need it on the Earth, uh, makes space solar power an extremely interesting and attractive technical option. The main element of a space solar power system is a large platform which is called a solar power satellite, some 37,000 kilometers above the Earth. On this platform, uh, incoming sunlight would be converted into electricity and then converted again from electricity into a low intensity microwave beam. And that beam would then be transmitted back to a receiver, which would then take the incoming microwave energy, turn it back into electricity, and deliver it to the grid uh, as it was needed. If I was to give you a really long-term vision of the energy future, I would go to Star Trek, where nobody talks about energy because it's available, it's abundant, it's free. Just imagine what would a world look like? How would we be as humans if energy wasn't a binding constraint? That's my vision of the future. And to achieve it, we must get there so that everybody has access to the affordable, reliable and clean energy they need and that we have an energy system that sustains and regenerates a healthy planet. There is no such thing as a quick, easy or fast energy transition. And it can't be achieved by governments or even the energy industry working alone. It requires a change from all of us. I come into many dialogues and leadership conversations where the focus on energy transition is always talked about in terms of technology and money. But we must remember that energy is a complex system which includes people. Humanizing energy recognizes that the future is really a user-centric energy system. It's not about production versus consumption, and it's not about supply versus demand. It's about connecting the dots and the health of connections in managing energy security, affordability and equity, and environmental sustainability. Renewable energy is gonna be essential uh, to solving the fossil fuel problem. Um, alternative proteins are going to be essential to solving the meat problem, but political activity um, and working through governments, um, that's where the real change comes. And we do need that level of real change. Never before in human history have we ever went from one age or epoch to another without a tr transformation or without an innovation. And so future innovation and these transformations play a, a vital critical part and sustainable development. If one of us suffers, we all suffer. We need to change it for the entire world. If we want to solve human suffering and our global grand challenges, we need to take a systemic approach and address all the multiple facets of a complex system. Africa, where I come from, produces only up to three or four percent of greenhouse gas emissions, and yet most of the impacts are felt strongly in Africa. Everything is related. If you do not tackle it in a system, you end up only fixing one thing here and forgetting the other, or fixing one thing here that results in a challenge elsewhere. How do we solve this great big puzzle with everybody, not just by ourselves? And for us to do that, we need to understand how everybody feels about it. What is everybody's stake in it? We need to make nature everybody's business.